Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody's hopping on saying hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Miranda. Sue. Good morning, Olin. Yes, we made it home safely, safe and sound. And I can attest to the fact, this is a fact, it is a lot easier and a lot quicker to fly home than it is to drive home, drive home from Phoenix. Um, that it was about two hours and one minute in an airplane coming home versus 18 and a half hours in a vehicle, in a car. Um, that's a lot, uh, that's a lot easier, uh, ride to be honest with you. Still tired when we got home, but, uh, but it was a lot easier to get home. We had a good time. It was, uh, it was hard to leave him still hard to leave him. Uh, he's been up there, uh, over two months now. Um, and it was still hard to leave him. Uh, but, uh, I'll get to see him again next week. Next week, I'm going to take his car. His car supposedly is done. I got to pick it up from the shop today. And, um, uh, I'm going to be driving his car back up to him next week so he can have his vehicle back. Um, and uh, then I'll be flying home. though. I'll have to drive it there, but I'm going to fly home after that. So, But anyhow, I'm going to tell you what. This is beautiful this morning. What a beautiful Monday morning it is. Um, nice and cool. Um, pretty high humidity, I'd say. Uh, it's been raining. It was raining when I went to bed last night. Just a real light, light rain. Raining right now. Um, but it sure beats. It was like 96, 97 uh, in Phoenix, which is pretty cool for them. But uh, uh, it feels good to be back home. Feels good to be back home. Good morning, Janet. Good morning, Gary and Charlotte. Good morning to everybody. But uh, anyhow, uh, Hope that uh, hope that y'all had a good weekend. Did y'all do anything fun, interesting this weekend? Um, we had a good time. We had a good time. We didn't do a whole lot. Didn't do a whole lot. Um, spent pretty much all day Saturday. Uh, there's this place in Tempe called the Tempe Marketplace that Wes took us to, and it is it is just like this huge outdoor. Um, Almost like our promenade mall here, um, or um, uh, almost like like Miss Sue, almost like the big Hagertown Outlet Mall up there. Um, but it's huge. It's a big. It's the biggest biggest thing I've ever seen. I mean, just just huge area. And we walked around that all Saturday. And they had a movie theater. We went in and watched The Goonies in the movie theater. That was I enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun. Uh, watching the Goonies. I saw the Goonies in theaters when I was like five uh, when it first came out. Uh, but to see it in the theaters again was just a really neat experience. I love that movie. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we had a, we had a really good time. Had a, had a lot of fun, but uh, anyhow, we're going to study the word of God for a few minutes. I get some more of this coffee. I'm tired this morning. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty tired this morning. Uh, but uh I'm going to get enough of this go juice, Amy. Maybe I'll make it through. Okay. But uh, we finished up. We finished up the book of Titus last week. And that was a good study, a real good study. Um, but uh, we're going back into the Old Testament again. And I've been kind of telling you guys that I want to... Uh, I want to kind of go through some of the lesser, the lesser studied books in Scripture. Uh, go through some of the some of the lesser, I guess, more overlooked passages of Scripture, um, because we get a lot of the we get a lot of the Gospels, we get a lot of you know Paul's letters, and and uh, we get a lot of the big stuff, you know, Proverbs and Genesis and 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 kings and we get a lot of that stuff you know at church and sunday school and uh, so i've been wanting to go through the, the smaller stuff so far we've gone through ecclesiastes we've gone through um lamentations we've gone through um nahum we've gone through titus i think that's all we've gone through um and so in in kind of getting ready and thinking about what we 
what we were going to start up today, what we were going to be looking at today. I wanted to take it back to, uh, wanted to take it back to the the minor prophets again in the Old Testament, and uh, uh, we're going to look in Joel. We're going to look through the book of Joel. Uh, the book of Joel is uh, um, it's got some great stuff in it. Uh, just kind of a history for the book of Joel. Not a whole lot is known about Joel. In the first verse, he gives his dad's name, uh, but that still doesn't serve to really identify who he is. Um, there are other Joels mentioned here and there in the Old Testament, but it's not it's not believed that this is the same Joel that uh, that that wrote the book of Joel, the prophet Joel. Uh, another really neat thing that I didn't know before I started studying this out: the book of Joel is one of the oldest prophetic books of the Old Testament that we have. Uh, I think the only book that was written earlier than the book of Joel, I think it was the book of Obadiah. Um, that's the only, that's the, those are the two oldest, um, books in, in the old Testament uh, uh, about the prophets, the oldest prophetic books in the old Testament. And I found that pretty neat. So, so all of the things that Joel says, everything that Joel talks about, um, it comes before, um, before the exile, before the fall, before, um, you know, we, as we studied through lamentations, it, it comes before lamentations. Um, it, it's one of the older books. I think it was, if I'm remembering right, it was written about 835 BC, um, which was, that's a few days ago, a few days ago. Um, but, uh, so just some interesting kind of, uh, background tidbits, some foundational work to, to know about Joel before we start tearing into the verses, tearing into what he says. Um, and, and uh, so let's just start reading them. We're going to read the first 12 verses, Joel chapter 1, verse 1 through 12. It says this, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. That which the palm worm, the palmer worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. That which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. Howl, O ye vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are with are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of man. So there's a lot going on here. There's a lot that he's talking about. And being a a one of what is considered the pro, uh, the prophets, the minor prophets, and we know that there's there's later prophecy that is given through Joel um, that uh, that is actually it comes past in the New Testament. And uh, um, we know that, that some events we'll get to here as we study it out, but some events that take place in the New Testament actually recall and quote uh, the book of Joel, some of the prophecies of Joel. And there are still preachers and teachers and, and, and ministers of the gospel that still refer back to some of Joel's prophecies. Um, and, and so being a, a minor prophet, being a prophetic word, here in the scriptures, we, we automatically want to try and go, okay, what, what future thing does this reference? What future event 
is Joel talking about? What exactly is going on here that, that Joel is trying to foreshadow or foretell? Have we seen it come to pass? Have we seen it already happen? Is it something that we can pinpoint back to in the time of Scripture, in a history uh, of Scripture um, that we can look back to and say, okay, yeah, this, this Scripture was fulfilled here or took place there? One of the neat things about Scripture, um, and I say this often, and, it's, and, and I say it often because uh, it, it comes up often, and, and, and I think it's something important for us to give, is how alive that Scripture is. And Scripture is so alive. The Bible, the Word of God, is so alive and and purposeful that it, what what we mean by alive is that it was relevant at the time that it was written, but also spoke of a relevance for times that were yet to come. Because when you look at what's going on here in these first twelve verses, um, Joel is writing an, uh, about an event that could be read both as relevant at the time that he wrote it, but also it is uh, relevant for a future time, relevant for times or events that are yet to pass, yet to happen. Um, in, in a very practical manner, if you study up what's going on here in the first 12 verses of Joel, and you look at the history and the time that it was written, um, he's basically writing out an event that was taking place at that moment. There was a locust plague that was on the land uh, of Judah at that time, uh, the likes that they had never seen before. Uh, the swarms of locusts had come, they'd come in. They'd taken over the fields. They were devouring all the crops, all the trees. They were, they were laying waste to everything that they came into contact with. And we understand, I mean, when you use the term locust today, um, it, it kind of denotes that very thought. Uh, the insects that come into the land, they devour everything that is there, and then they leave. And when they leave, it's left desolate, it's, it's left empty, it's left a waste, and, and there's nothing left in their wake. And that's what was happening here in a very real manner, in a very real sense, uh, in, in Judah in, in uh, Joel's time. And, and he, he talks about this for a while. He talks about how... Um, you know, the locusts have come in, uh, what the worms didn't eat, uh, the, the caterpillars ate, what the caterpillars didn't eat, the locusts took care of. And basically what he was saying was everything's gone. The crops are gone. Um, we're in a time of famine. Well, th this plague of locusts has absolutely devastated uh, our crops and our people. It's, it's taking care uh, of, of destroying every, everything that we had. It's gone. Um, it's it's all laid to waste, and it all started. You know, when you think of a locust, a locust alone by itself is a very small, very small insect, like a grasshopper, a large grasshopper, and and a single a single locust, single grasshopper coming into your crop is not that big a deal. Just one isn't going to do a whole lot of damage, but that one brings in more, and all of a sudden the crops are laid to waste, and and there's devastation in the land. And, and so in a very real sense and in a very real um, real meaning there, Joel is writing about, about a real event that is taking place. And when you look in verse number three, uh, in verse number two and three even, uh, you see he basically says, hey, you old men, have you ever seen anything like this before? Have you ever experienced anything like this before? Did your fathers see this kind of plague come on the land and did, did your grandfathers know about this kind of thing happening ever at a time in history? Um, have we ever seen anything like this? And, and so when you look at it and you see that that's kind of what's going on, it's a very real thing that happens. But we can understand that Joel is speaking from a very practical place in Scripture. But not only is it relevant and real to the time that it was written and what Joel was talking about, but it can also be read as a prophetic warning for the for the reader in the future. And the reason that we see that is that there's a couple of things that we that that we read um, that st that uh, stood out to me. That stood out to me um, because I think what we can take from this passage in our life today in 2020 is we need to wake up and pay attention. We need to wake up and pay attention. God's people need to wake up and pay attention. 
We've been complacent for too long. We have been distracted for far too long. <clears throat> We've allowed the little grasshopper here and there to come into our crops, come into our life, and we weren't paying attention. And now uh, there's devastation on the land. And we, we can read this in a couple of different ways. We can, we can see a few things that he says. When he starts off in, in uh, uh, particular in verse number five, in verse number five, what does he say in verse number five? He says, wake up, <laughs> awaken, you drunkards, wake up. You've, you've, you've not been paying attention. You have been uh, imbibing and embellishing yourself on the goods of the land. You have been um, almost in a sense, you have been helping the locusts devour the crops in the fields Instead of supplying, instead of tending to, instead of taking care of, you've been a part of the problem. You've been a part of the problem. And I can't help but look around and 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 and, and I'm gonna try my best to not let my my past as a pastor cloud my my judgment here. Praise God, I have the best church. I have the best church in the land today. Been there over five years. We've had zero problems. We have been working towards, you know, kingdom purposes. We have a we have a group of people at Harris that work together, not against each other. But I've been in those churches in the past. I've been a part of those churches in the past. I've been a pastor of the churches in the past where people were not interested in working together to to further the cause of the church or the cause of the kingdom of God. But they worked against each other because they were fighting for tradition. They were fighting for what they wanted and they wanted their place and they wanted to be in charge of this and they wanted to establish their kingdom. And they became imbibers and embellishers of, of the, the things that the church was doing, instead of providing for, they were damaging and destroying as much as any locust swarm could do. And it's really sad, man. It's really sad because what we, what we see is we see, and, and, and we're seeing this more and more today than we ever have before, but we're seeing churches that were like that, churches that were filled with people like that are now closing down because the instead of doing the work to further the cause of Christ, to further the kingdom of God, what they're seeing is they're seeing that all their years of devastating and swarming the church, their own church, um, has now led them with nothing left to give. And the doors have to shut down. The doors have to close. And he says there, he says, wait, awaken. Awaken, you drunk. Wake up, you drunk. <laughs> it's pretty strong terminology there, but, uh, but I think it's relevant even for 2020. Wake up. You've imbibed on the things of the, you've played church for a long time. You've, you've devoured the, the, the preachers that have come and gone. You've devoured the good people that tried to come in and do a good work. You've devoured the worship of the Lord. You've devoured the finances of the church. You've, you've devoured um, the properties of the church that could have been used for the kingdom of God. You've devoured and, and laid them to waste and they're desolate now. And it's gone. It's gone. Your church is gone. Your kingdom is gone. The locust swarm that came in and did a work, you were, you were devouring right alongside of it. Later on, he uses the term, and I don't want to go there just yet because I'm going to hit it at the end, but he says, he says, you ought to be ashamed. You ought to be ashamed. Now, I know for, for, for us that are watching, though, we're saying, well, you know, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not a drunk. I'm not devouring the things of the world. I'm not, I'm not imbibing like that. You know, I'm not, I'm not, uh, um, desolating and devastating my church and devastating and desolating, you know, um, get the kingdom of God on this earth. Um, no, probably not. You know, you wouldn't be watching morning devotions from a knucklehead like me if, if, if that was your attitude. Um, but what about, what about things in this world? We get so so busy. We get so um, we get so caught up in things that that we shouldn't, or things that are 
uh, of lesser importance than of kingdom things, than of, of godly things. Um, and when we get caught up in the wrong thing, the right thing doesn't get taken care of like it should. When we get caught up in the wrong thing, then we're not tending to the things we should be tending to. Um, and, and again, at the end, he talks about, uh, he says, shame on you, husbandmen, vineyards. Those were the workers of the fields. Those were the people that should have been protecting the fields from the locust swarm. There could have been some measures put in place that would have protected them. There could have been some work that would have been done early on to take care of the locust swarms that were coming in and attempting to do uh, damage to their crops and fields, but they weren't even paying attention. They didn't care. They weren't watching their fields. They weren't taking care of the things they should have been taking care of. They were tending to unimportant things. Their attention was focused on unimportant, or maybe not even just unimportant things, but lesser important things. Things that should have been of a lower, uh, a lower priority. Um, and again, in the church realm, we get caught up in stuff that just doesn't matter. Uh, we get caught up in, in, in pews versus chairs. We get caught up in colors of, of, of carpet, colors of wall. We get caught up in, in, in when we have service, how often we have service. We, we get caught up in um, do, we have, do we have just a piano or a full band? We get caught up in do we have one singer or many singers? We get caught up in do we have a worship pastor or do we have a song leader and and all of these things really are 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 not really all that important i mean i have been in a church i've been in a church fight a church fight and, and i didn't fight alongside i stood back dumbfounded a church fight over over chairs versus pews um i'm a chair guy myself because you get a defined seat you know how many exactly people you can fit in your sanctuary. You get diversity because you can move things around. That's just my personal preference. It's not scriptural. It's not kingdom. It's just preference. But you know what? I like it. I like a pew too. But what have we forgotten? What is what? What purpose do the pews and the chairs serve? A place to rest your hind end. <laughs> it's not a spiritual thing. Well, well. Praise God, Pastor. It's just not a church if it's not a pew. Well, praise God, church people. It's just a place you set your butt. <laughs> and we're going to fight over like it's a spiritual thing. It's not important. And, and we just get caught up in lesser important and not important things. And when we do, the important things slip by. When churches are fighting over stuff like that, they're not fighting for the soul of man. When churches are fighting over stuff like that, they're not fighting on their knees praying for the lost. When churches are fighting over stuff like that, let's take it even, I'm picking on the church this morning for some reason, but, but moms and dads, moms and dads, we major sometimes on the minor stuff and we, we're not fighting for the important stuff. We're not fighting for the important stuff. Um, the important stuff in my family's life the thing that's been important for me with my kids, and I'm not saying I've been perfect. There have absolutely been times that I've made a big deal out of minor stuff, uh, that I've made a big deal out of unimportant stuff, and it was over personal preference or personal stuff. Yes, Lauren, drums or no drums. I was in an argument uh, with a church leadership years ago when I brought drums. Drums paid for by the church. An offering was taken up so church could purchase drums. The church people paid for the drums, and leadership came to me and said I was introducing honky-tonk music to the church. Uh, what was I talking about before? Um, yeah, as a pastor, I've, I've, I've majored on minor stuff. As a, as a father, not a pastor, I've majored on minor stuff before, and, 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 and I shouldn't have. But, but my biggest priority as a dad, as, as, a, as a father, is number one, that my kids learn to love and serve the Lord. That's important to me. Number two, I have, I have drilled, I have drilled into my older two kids, and I will when the time becomes appropriate for it with my younger two, but I've drilled that the partner that you choose to align yourself with in life, that they serve God the way that you do, that they love God the way that you do, 
because it's important to me that my kids stay in church. And you guys know as well as I do, if you marry somebody that don't go to church, it's likely that you won't go either. That's just facts. And then that would also mean my grandbabies would not be raised in church. And that's scary to me. That that I don't even have grandkids yet. It's not even on the horizon, I don't think. But it's still already a priority to me. And when you look in verse in verse number three, he says, Tell your children, tell your grandchildren, tell your tell the next generation of people about this 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 locust uh, plague that came. Listen, we ought to already be teaching our kids, training our kids. Listen, we had a responsibility. Church leaders had a responsibility. Dads, moms have a responsibility. Grandmas, grandpas have a responsibility to be telling our kids to watch out and be careful because unimportant things become way too important in our lives and the really important things get left behind. They get neglected. And all of a sudden, what happens? Here's what happens. That small little thing, that, that little locust, that little grasshopper, that when we saw one or two of them, it was no big deal because one or two of them isn't going to damage or destroy a crop. That one or two, those one or two are going to bring in the plague. They're going to bring in the plague. And in our life, let's go back to the church. Let's go back to churches. When pastors and leadership in churches and teachers in Sunday school classes and youth pastors uh, and youth directors, youth workers, um, when we have just allowed just a little bit of the worldly teaching, it's not that big a deal. Uh, it's not that, that major of a deal. We're wanting to reach and bring in more people, reach and bring in more kids. So we're going to be a little more inclusive in this. We're going to be a little less judgmental on that. And we're going to just we're going to kind of kind of try and 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 aim at a certain uh, group of people, or or we're going to try and bring in this. We're going to not teach on this portion of scripture, or not preach on that portion of scripture. We got lazy, and little locusts from the world culture came into the church. We didn't think it was that big a deal because it was just one or two little grasshoppers, one or two little insects. It wasn't that big of a problem. wasn't that big of a deal. And all of a sudden, before we knew it, we were overwhelmed. The church is overwhelmed. There are churches today that are overwhelmed and they don't see a, uh, any sign of help. There are churches today that are overwhelmed and they don't have any clue how they're going to move beyond it. And it all started because at some point in time in history, somebody who should have been on their knees praying for their church, somebody who should have been in the word studying to preach to their church, to direct their church, to, 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 to protect their congregation. Listen, pastors, we're pastors. We are supposed to be um, protecting our flock from the wolves of this world, from the enemy of God's people. We, we're supposed to be in prayer. We're supposed to be teaching and training and protecting them. Leadership, we, we're supposed to be protecting, praying for. But, but instead, we let just a few things get by so that we could build in numbers, so that we could have a better bank account, so that we could build a bigger sanctuary, a big, bigger building. Um, we, we had to have that gym. What good is that gym doing a lot of churches now? Not a whole lot. Listen, I'd love to have a gym at Harris Baptist Church. I'd love to have a gym for our, for our youth to be able to, to, to congregate in and play basketball in. We could eat a big dinner in, mm, church dinner. But that gym that a lot of people sacrifice to pay for right now isn't doing them a whole lot of good, is it? I haven't been able to meet in that gym for about, um, what, nine, ten months, seven, eight months, however long it's been. Unimportant things clouded the important things. And then when it was all said and done, when it was all said and done, you look back and you saw how devastated the place was, how devastated the lives were, how devastated your family was because husbands, fathers, moms, wives, you did not focus on the important things and take care of protecting your family, your marriage. A lot of marriages have been left devastated 
in the wake of this year because we weren't protecting them. We weren't fighting for them. Husbands and wives, you spend way too much time fighting against each other than you do fighting for each other. Do you remember why you fell in love in the first place? We forgot it. We were too busy taking care of self, too busy taking care of, of, of getting what we wanted out of this life. And we weren't busy taking care of each other. A lot of churches that aren't going to make it past this pandemic. Sad. But a lot of churches that aren't going to make it past this pandemic. A lot of marriages that are not going to make it past this pandemic. A lot of families that are going to be broken beyond this pandemic. And it's tragic. It's tragic. But I think what Joel is saying there serves as a warning for us. Wake up. Pastors, wake up. You have a responsibility to protect and lead the congregation of people that God has placed you responsible for. Wake up. Stop trying to gain as many people as you can. Stop trying to gain popularity within the culture and community. Stop trying to be uh, Mr. Popular um, and start being the shepherd that God called you to be, Pastor. Start fighting for the right stuff. Start fighting for the right things. Church member, you've got a responsibility there at the church too. You've got a responsibility there at the church too. I've said, I've said this. I have said this throughout this. I, I think even from the very beginning of, of when churches first had to, you know, put off meeting together um, and, and, you know, we were, we were only doing an online service and, and a lot of churches were only doing, there are some churches that are still only doing online services. Um, but I've said this, I feel like that this is a sifting. I think this is a sifting um, because a lot of people, <clears throat> a lot of people who were going to church that weren't really, they weren't really in it. They weren't really there. They just went through this. I think a lot of them aren't going to go back. I think a lot of them aren't going to go back. I think this has been a sifting from the real deal, from, from the players, so to speak. It's a sifting. And let's just be absolutely honest right now. Let's be absolutely honest. And what I'm going to say may sound, may sound crude and it may sound mean, but it's just the truth. I don't care what's going on out in this world right now, but if you can go to work, if you can go out to eat, and if you can go to Walmart and get your groceries, why can't you come to church? That doesn't make any sense to me. Oh, but pastor, the people at Walmart don't want to shake my hands. If you don't want somebody at church to shake your hands, don't put your hand out. No big deal. We can do all this other stuff, but when it comes to the house of God, no, no, no. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. Listen. If you're ill and you are susceptible to stuff, then by all means, you know I, you have my support. And I love you because a lot of folks in our church in Harris, and remember, when I'm talking about the church, I'm not just talking about those of you that attend my church. I'm talking about the universal church. And we have a lot of people in our specific church in Harris that because of, because of health issues and because of of, of conditions that are already unfavorable in their lives and in their bodies, they watch from home. And those of you that do that and you watch from home, I still consider you to be a part of the church. You've not been sifted out, but there are a lot of people. There are a lot of people that, that they can't go to church, but they don't even bother to try to be a part online. We have a lot of our folks that they can't be there. They're being cautious, and I understand that, and you have my absolute total support of that. Um, but they're still watching online. They're still commenting online. They're still participating online. They're still giving. They're still giving online. There's still people that when we come to church throughout the week, they've, they've dropped their tithes through the slot in the door. So ah, what are, we, are we fighting for the right thing? We've let that little, that little excuse, that little bit 
of the world, that little bit of culture, creep in, and it's devastating us. It's devastating us. So how do we end this, Pastor? Because you're, you're kind of in a bummer mode right now. Well, a whole other part that I, that I didn't even look at, he talks about how our offering to the Lord has even been cut off. When, when we allow too much of the world to come in, we don't even have enough to give to God like we should. We don't even have enough to praise God. We come to church, and we don't even have any praise to offer Him. It's been devastated. It's been destroyed. It's been it's been cut off. We've and, and what we do try and offer Him, it's the used up, chewed up, rotten parts that weren't devastated by the culture of this world, because we let just a little bit in here and there. Um, so what do we do? How do we end this thing, Pastor? Um, wake up. Pay attention. Stop sleepwalking through life. Stop sleepwalking through church. Stop sleepwalking through your marriage. Stop sleepwalking through your through your parental uh, your parental responsibilities. Stop sleepwalking. Be there. Be present. Be active. Be a part. Participate. He's talking to the vineyard workers and uh, uh, the the husbandmen. Uh, he's talking to the workers of the field, the people that had an active responsibility in protecting and managing and tending and taking care of the, the crops. That's us. As a husband, as a spouse, as a wife, we have a responsibility to tend to our marriage. It's not going to stay fit and healthy on accident by itself. It takes both of us working on it. As parents, your kids aren't just going to magically grow up and be good, productive workers uh, and contributors to society. They're not going to grow up and be an active part of the church on accident. It requires us tending to them. It requires us taking care of them. And in the church, the church isn't going to be healthy, and it's not going to work out uh, at the end of this pandemic and, and, and be successful through this if we don't work together to tend the field and the flock, we got to do it together. We got to fight for the right things. Let go of the unimportant stuff. Fight for the right stuff. And then I, I kept going back to verse number three. Tell you, children, if we want our if we want our church to continue to be successful, we got to already be training up the next generation of leaders. I loved it. I was talking with Wes this weekend about the church. He was asking how the church was going and, and you know, if so-and-so was still there, if so-and-so was there and, and, you know, miss this person, miss that per person at church. And, and he was asking about our youth and, you know, we haven't really been able to start back youth stuff just yet. And um, Harris, we're in between youth pastors right now. We don't have a youth pastor right now. And, uh, and I was thinking about, you know, talking about it with him and stuff and, and I said, yeah, I said, we need somebody right now, but we've got some young people. We've got some teenagers that are attending, pretty good group of teenagers that are attending. So we're just praying that God will send the right person um, that will step into that ministry position and take take that over. And, and Wes goes, you know, maybe when I get home, I can step in and help do something. I love that about my son. I love that about him. He's, he's, he's going to be there until May. And he's already thinking about what he can do to be active in his church here when he gets back. I love that about him. I, I love that he's already thinking about that. Um, that 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 speaks a lot to me that he's already in that in that vein of thought. So, um, but what are we doing? We got to be active. We got to take care of it. We got to we got to tend to it. We got to do the right thing. Amen. We got to teach our kids. Train up the next generation of leaders. Um, listen, I would love already right now. I have no plans to leave Harris. I don't. I want to die in the pulpit at Harris Baptist Church. Um, a long time from now, not this week or next week, um, but a long time from now. I want to be an old elderly guy that gets up, preaches my last sermon, says amen, and falls over dead on the stage. Wouldn't that be a sight? Uh, wouldn't that be a that'd be a great sight? But um, I would love, in all seriousness, I would love for God to go ahead and send the individual that I should be training up 
to take my place as pastor. So that when the time does come that God calls me out or calls me home, that there's already somebody in place there, that the, that the transition would be seamless. Um, because we should be training up, we should be training up already the people to take care of the flock, the congregation when we're gone, when we're gone. So husbandmen, uh, vineyard workers, um, we have a responsibility. Let's wake up. Let's pay attention. Let's focus on the right things. Let's fight for the right stuff. And we'll see that through this plague-demic that we're going through right now, we're going to come through it on the other side just fine. Your marriage is going to be good. Your relationship with your kids is going to be good. Your relationship at your work is going to be good. Your, your relationship with your church people, your church is going to be good. And on the other side of this, those who make it through will be stronger because we did the work we needed to do to take care of the plague at hand. Let me pray for you before we finish up here. Father God, Lord, I, I'm thankful for your word and how it is relevant and real, not just for the time that it was written, but for us today as we are reading it and studying it out. And Lord, I pray that right now, God, that the word that you have shared, that Lord, that we would take it, we would apply it to our lives. Lord, let us chew on it for today and think about it. Father, we have a responsibility as husbands, as wives, as fathers, as mothers, as grandparents, as leaders in the church, as workers of the field in your kingdom. We all have a responsibility to take care that the enemy does not creep into these areas of our life and damage and destroy and, and devastate and ravage what's going on in those areas. Lord, thank you for your protection over our marriages, our families, in our church. Lord, I just pray that God, that, that as we recognize your protection, Lord, that it would make us be even more diligent to pay attention to the attacks that the enemy is throwing at us. Lord, attacks through our families, attacks through politics, attacks, Lord, through hatred for one human being to another. Lord, attacks within the church where culture creeps in and tries to dictate what can be taught or preached and what can't. Lord, help us to pay attention and, and protect the crops in our life. Lord, you said in your word that the, the harvest was plenteous. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send workers into the field. Lord, let us be the workers. Father, because the field, the field is 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 under attack. The field is in danger. Lord, help us to take care of the field that you've given us. Lord, bless our church. Lord, bless every person that's listening, God. I pray that our hearts be turned to you today. Lord, let this Monday be a good day. Lord, thank you for this rain. Thank you for this weather, this blessing that you've given us. And Lord, be with our churches. Father, be with Harris. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you've continued to provide for our church. Lord, we've continued to see uh, the Holy Spirit doing great work. We've continued to see growth. Lord, continue to give us vision, Father, to know how to move um, and serve in the way that you'd have us to move and serve. Lord, Father, for every pastor, every church, Lord, that is seeking to honor you and take care of your kingdom, work your field, Lord, I pray you direct them in that word. God, be with us the rest of this day. Keep us safe. Keep us whole. Keep us healthy. And God, we just thank you and praise your name. Amen. Have a great day today. Hope that you were blessed by the word today. Hope that uh, that it just kind of sparked you to wake up, pay attention, fight for the right thing. Fight the right fight. Fight it in the right way. And uh, recognize the field that God's given you because we're blessed. We're blessed. God bless you. See you here again tomorrow morning. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.